thank you everybody for attending. And in the future, when this is not live, thank you for everybody who's watching the video of this webinar. It's been a challenging past couple of weeks in not just our country, but across the whole world for the issues related to the death of George Floyd and in general, the issues that have surfaced. For some people, it's new. For a lot of people, this is old, about racial inequality and economic inequality. We have a terrific panel that is joining us. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on their intros. It is an all-star cast of experts. Point out these are all members that were either past or present members of the board of directors of the International Economic Development Council. Marva Bryant is not able to join us. I know she was on the list of panelists. With us today is Joanne Crary, who is the president of Saginaw Future. Also Rod Miller, who's the CEO of Invest Puerto Rico. Courtney Pogue, who is the a director of the Office of Economic Development for the city of Dallas. Lanier Richardson, who is the executive director of the, in the, actually, I don't know what this, this, this is. C-U-E-E-D, I don't know, you have such a big title, Lanier. Right, it's Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development. We, we call it CUDE at Rutgers Business. So, so CUDE at the Rutgers uh, Business School. And my name is Anatolia Ubalde. I am the CEO and founder of Size Up and Managing Director of GIS Planning. So a good place to start in the discussion is actually around this issue of Black Lives Matter. This is a term that has troubled some people and, and I, uh, panelists, you can feel free to chime in because when people say Black Lives Matter, then some people say what? All lives matter, right? So let, let's just address this right up front. And, and I like to explain this in a way that Nick Cannon, who is a comedian, explained, and, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, after a conversation that he had with one of his white friends, he said, I had to put it into Caucasian. When y'all say save the whales, that doesn't mean forget about all the other fish in the ocean. It just means whales need saving. They're in danger, just like black people. I paraphrase that to make <laughs> A little bit friendlier for those who may be listening in the office or what uh, comedian Michael Che said, which is if your spouse said, you know, baby, do you love me? And you said, I love everybody. I love all God's creatures equally. Well, you know, the point is, is that what's meant in this in saying Black Lives Matter is connected. It is to say that Black Lives Matter too. And to give this even more context, when we say Black Lives Matter in economic development, we don't mean that they don't matter in public health or social services, right? What we're saying is, but let's focus on this issue. And so for that, I'm going to start with a bit of context. First of all, we know that African Americans are being discriminated against, impoverished, and killed disproportionately. It's deeply interconnected with the issue of economic development. It's the reason the August 28, 1963 event that included Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. You'll notice that the word jobs comes before freedom, and that was really no accident. Because economic development is one of the central elements related to racial inequality in America, the profession of economic development must put itself within the center of creating solutions. The data analysis about the economic marginalization of people of color is unambiguous. Racial disparity in income exists across the country. Median white households make 70,000 compared to black households that make only 41,000. A key measurement of economic development is wealth. In 2016, the typical U.S. white family had a net worth of 171000 which was nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family with 17150 White families receiving much larger inheritance than black families account for much of this wealth gap. In the metro area where Minneapolis police killed George Floyd, the racial income gap is especially wide. White households make 83,000 per year. Black households only make 36,000. It's the second largest black to white income gap of any metro in the US. As a state, Minnesota ranked close to the bottom of both employment gap by race, which was 47th, and income gap by race, which was 38th. 10% of African-American residents of the Twin Cities were unemployed compared to just under 4% for white American residents. African-Americans are bearing a disproportionately negative economic impact because of the coronavirus pandemic. African-American entrepreneurs are struggling as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and minority-owned businesses 
have been far less likely to get government aid from the giant CARES Act passed by Congress. Whereas overall, about 38% of small business owners who applied for government aid reported getting it, only 2% of Black and Latino-owned businesses reported getting the aid that they asked for. So as economies open up, African-American-owned businesses may not make it through. African-Americans are being left out of the coronavirus economic recovery. While unemployment fell to 12.4% in May of 2020 from 14.2% in April, while Black unemployment rose from 16.8% from 16.7%. More than 1,000 unarmed Black people died as a result of police harm since 2013. Approximately one-third were Black. Unarmed Blacks are 1.3 times more likely to be killed by police than unarmed Whites. In Minnesota, Black Americans are nearly four times as likely to be killed by law enforcement, with Black victims comprising 20% of those killed, despite comprising only 5% of the overall population. A study of the U.S. Sentencing Commission concluded that Black men got 19.1% longer prison sentences compared to white men for the exact same federal crimes, even after controlling for criminal history and other factors. So America is a country where people are mistreated, punished, and killed at higher rates when the color of their skin is dark. Brown and black skinned people have lower incomes and less opportunities than white Americans. Now throughout history, the UN, United States economy was built through violence perpetrated against people of color. This included stealing land from Native Americans, the slavery of African people, the westward expansion built by Asian labor, and then when the national borders of our country were not seen as enough, the expansion of the American economic empire with colonies in Asia Pacific and the Caribbean. Economic developers understand that the economic inputs of real estate, labor, raw materials are essential for the output of economic growth. America built its economy by cheaply acquiring these inputs through theft, slavery, discrimination, and colonization, all at violent harm to people of color. The protests in the streets today are connected to the outcomes of, of a continuity of historical American economic development policy. The data related to the unequal arrest, incarceration, and police harm to African Americans may seem less connected to traditional economic measurements that we use in our profession, such as income, wealth, and unemployment. However, the incarceration of African Americans was intentional in the development of the U.S. economy. The 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. But the exception that involuntary servitude is legal if someone is convicted of a crime is the post-slavery loophole that enabled the U.S. to incarcerate African Americans en masse to rebuild the U.S. South post-Civil War. This started the first U.S. prison boom, and it was directed toward taking a portion of the four million freed slaves and putting them back to work as prisoners with no compensation to rebuild a Southern economy that was previously dependent on slave labor and replacing it with imprisoned labor, making former slaves functionally slaves again. Historical traditions in economic value created by imprisoned Black men set precedent for continued legal tradition. Today's prison industrial complex profits business suppliers to the industry and impoverishes the Black community by removing 28.5% of Black men from society and, of course, their economic output by placing them in prison. African Americans have tried to build wealth throughout the U U.S. history, but their efforts have been restricted in many ways, beginning with 246 years of slavery and followed by congressional mismanagement of the Freeman Savings Bank, which left over 60,000 depositors with losses of nearly $3 million in 1874, the violent massacre decimating Tulsa's Greenwood District in 1921, which, by the way, we're coming up on the 99-year anniversary of this, so this was an area that had a population of about 10,000 that thrived as an epicenter of African-American business and culture. It was referred to as the Black Wall Street. It was one of the wealthiest places for African-Americans in the U.S., as well as disc discriminatory policies throughout the 20th century, including Jim Crow era Black Codes, which uh, strictly limited opportunities in many, many Southern states, the GI Bill, the New Deal's Fair Labor Standards Act, exemption of domestic agricultural and service occupations, and redlining. Wealth was taken from these communities before it had the opportunity to grow. The protests, riots, and looting related to racial inequality that has occurred on the streets of the United States in the past days, and, and I would just say the past in general, are entwined with this history of the U.S. economy and policies of economic development. 
award-winning author Kimberly Jones was interviewed during the filming of interviews of people demonstrating related to the killing of George Floyd. And it's worth watching. There's not enough time to get into it in, in this webinar, but I encourage all of you to watch it. She makes points that I think are relevant to the work that we do in economic development. She brought up these issues. The first is when people ask why African-American community would burn down their own communities, she points out that they don't own any. They don't own the real estate that's being burned, the shops. In large, they don't have equity. She also said that people need to ask why the financial gap between poor Blacks is so big that people see riots as their only opportunity to get things and are willing to walk through broken glass windows to take what they can. The third thing she raises is, if, is there's a fracture of the sh social compact. And in this, she was referring to a dis discussion that Trevor Noah talked about. This is another video you can find online or on a white paper that, that I wrote about. But in general, what this means is that we all agree, the social compacts, we all agree to follow the law with an understanding that it will be used equally and fairly. And that the unequal treatment under the law and by law enforcement agencies is resulting in people abandoning the social agreements that are inequitable. I also want to bring this issue to the issue of us as economic developers, because we need to recognize and repair the economic dam damage that our profession has caused that helped facilitate the current state of disenfranchisement of African Americans. Economic development programs of the past, including urban renewal, were explicit policies of displacement of the poor and racial minorities. In my hometown of San Francisco, James Baldwin talked about how basically the urban renewal means Negro removal. And in fact, that's what happened. African American communities and neighborhoods were demolished. Now I think it's time to really talk about this issue amongst all of us, and I'm going to bring it back to Joanne, Rod, Courtney, Lanier. But now I think we'll all be able to see each other pretty well. Marva joined as well, which is great. Mar Marva, you're here. Hello, Marva. I think she's on mute, though. Yep. She sent me a note. She's, she's, she does have her previous commitment. She's trying to multitask, so I don't okay, think she's able to speak. Okay. But she's listening in, and let's hope great. that she clears. Great. Wonderful. What I'd like to do is really just start, anybody can join, with the first question, which is for, for each of you, could you please share your general or specific thoughts about racial economic inequality? Well, I, I'd be glad to, to go first, and I, I've, I've just put together a few thoughts, and I'll, I'll share those, and, uh, and, and we can go for there. And so, so, you know, I believe that we're really at the cusp of a major economic shift in opportunity globally. The question is, can this shift present an opportunity for people of color, black people in the United States to gain economic parity and repair some of the damages caused by centuries of systemic discrimination. I'd like to think that the answer to that question is yes, and that, and that time for change is now. Uh, every major economic shift throughout history, whether industrialization or the rise of the computer age has created new pockets of wealth and opportunity. And as protests occur around the country in response to George Floyd's murder, Americans of all hues have come together to hold leadership account, accountable, articulating that we expect more and better from our leadership. And I think government is at the core of that. Government needs to deliver on that mandate. Cities and other governmental institutions not only hold the puzzle pieces to resolve the dilemma, but have historically implemented policies and practices that have led to the, this ongoing economic divide. Uh, between February and April of 2020, the number of working African-American business owners in the U.S. plummeted more than 40%. Uh, Hispanic-owned businesses dropped by 32%, Asian-owned businesses dropped by nearly a quarter, and immigrant businesses fell by a whopping 36% over the same period. Uh, businesses owned by people of color seem to suffer from a perfect storm. Right now, the high concentration in lifestyle businesses and communities that have been overwhelmed by the virus. So while the coronavirus is going on, we, that's also negatively accelerating the downward uh, trajectory of businesses, of, of black businesses and businesses owned by uh, people uh, of color. As the old adage goes, when, when white America gets a cold, uh, uh, black communities get pneumonia. And, 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 then, and, and I would say that as it relates specifically to some of the, the issues that you raised, that there are a few things that I think are foundational. Number one is that blacks are doing worse than whites in every indicator of performance, whether it's economic, whether it's social, whether it's health care. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's kind of foundational in the understanding, and I think you laid that out well. The second piece, which I also think that you laid out very well, is that this is a structural challenge. 
whether we talk about red, and it's, and it's more than just slavery, it's a structural challenging related to redlining, uh, related to HUD and housing policies that didn't allow black people to, to, to get home loans. It's uh, related to the reality that, you know, many black business districts around the co uh, country from, from Black Wall Street to Black Bottom, and Black Wall Street in Tulsa to Black Bottom in Detroit uh, were knocked down and government really led that stuff and that there are really different rules to the game. Um, uh, and then and, and I guess the last point that I would mention uh, before before closing is that, you know, this really this inequality is really rooted in fear. And that fear is and, and this is where I think why I think economic developers are are so important. That fear is a fear of is, is related to lack that there are limited resources. And there's this concern that if we fix these structural uh, challenges and we really offer opportunities for everyone, that's going to mean less opportunities and less less economic uh, opportunity for, for, for white people. And, that, and that's just not true. Uh, and so economic developers, we have an, a, a tremendous opportunity to drive policy programming that can really uh, uh, provide a greater access to opportunity and right some of these wrongs. I'll stop there. That was great. That was great. <laughs> next. It's so true about the um, about resources, it's almost like love, right? The more you give, the more you get. And it's not gonna, by giving it away, doesn't mean you're gonna have less of it. So, well, first of all, I like to say thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. We're all friends and we all served on a national board together. So it's so good to see you guys again, because of course I'm, you know, term limited off of it. So I haven't seen you in a while. But you know, to answer this question, I. I looked like you did, Anatolio, at some statistics. And one of the things that struck me was when you look at the US median wealth for white households, it's 10 times greater than for black households with eight times greater than Hispanic households. And I think this number is significantly higher than most people would have believed. And I think that's part of the problem. Racial economic inequality involves so many different areas from education to workforce, and from quality of life to public safety. So it really touches every area of our life. I think that the murder of, it's, it's really like you said, it's a perfect storm, right? We had the murder of George Floyd and everybody was at home. So everybody got to watch it. And if you were a mother like I am, and you heard him cry for his mom, it touched a lot of mothers and a lot of people that aren't of color to care more. And I gotta tell you, I have never been a history scholar. I didn't like history in school, but I read your blog on Italio. I thought it was wonderful. I've been reading a lot over the last three weeks and learning about the inequities that are taking place in our country that have happened for centuries. And I think that we have a tremendous opportunity right now to make meaningful change. And that's why I'm on this panel. Thank you, John. Well, I will say, you know, the murder of George Floyd was kind of like the match that struck the fire. So I hope that this conversation continues going forward. I hope in the next 90 days, we still are talking about, you know, change to the system, change to some of our policies. If you talk about some of the rules that it relates to HUD, you know, the block grant rules are 40, 50 years old and they're outdated and they kind of keep people locked in a, a certain parameter. And we talk about some of the policies of urban renewal. I'm from Chicago. You know, I, you see what happened with urban renewal, how, you know, Bronzeville was basically this destroyed. And you had urban renewal with some of the um, developments taking place from housing projects with the housing authority until you had, you know, these super blocks created, uh, which stretch, which used to stretch from 35th down to 55th with 30 uh, stateway gardens down to Robert Taylor and almost 50,000 people lived in this area at one time or another for 50 years with no services, no access, but basically locked away. And you look at other areas where we had the core of the black community in, in Chicago was basically this is taken out by the development of met life for Prairie Shores and Lake Meadows apartment complexes. So 
we were never really part of the table at the at the table to have these discussions. Uh, you know, we look at some of the other rules and programs we work on for small businesses and providing capital. I think what's been exposed with the COVID nineteen crisis is that yes, we have black businesses, but there's some need for really helping businesses get stabilize and really structure its businesses. I think you, you know, having gone through this process and the PPP program, a lot of businesses need more than just capital, they need structural help. And I see that every day when I'm working through my programs here in Dallas to help black businesses, it's the basics, you know, your balance sheet, the accounting statements, uh, the marketing plan, your management structure, your ownership structure, you know, how do you go from a sole proprietorship to actual company that has employees and you know, one of the things that the PPP calls for your payroll. Well, if you never really set up a payroll process with a 941 statement from the Internal Revenue Service, then you really don't have payroll. You have an independent contractors and people are called those employees. There are, those aren't employees, they're 1099s, they're independent contractors. Conversation passed in the next 90 days. It's about changing some of these policies at the state level, city level, and the federal level. So hopefully people realize that this is just not a, a sprint. This is a marathon. Mm -hmm. Lanier, you wanna? I do. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I have been talking about this as the, the pandemic, the protest, and the political pandemonium. Right? And it's really um, created, I believe, an opportunity for us to focus on sort of wealth creation specifically needed uh, in communities of color. Right? I, uh, all the stats and the history that you, uh, you pointed out, uh, to me is very clear that if we can find ways to help black Americans participate in the economy more fully, uh, many of the challenges that you raise will, will dissipate. Uh, you know, nowhere in the world are poor people uh, healthy, educated, safe, um, and non-affluent um, when there's, you know, not business, right? So that my thinking is simply, if we can just do business with people of color, uh, we'll take responsibility for identifying and training and helping the next generation uh, of, of entrepreneurs uh, in supporting uh, our own community, right? That's, I really believe at its core, as economic developers, we have an opportunity to really create, you know, wealth and really focus on how do you create wealth uh, for people of color. And, uh, you know, it's very clear to me, wealth is created by owning assets. And uh, all of my work is helping entrepreneurs either own or control or lead uh, commercial real estate development or forming businesses that have growth potential and sort of pointing the way as economic developers, we can do this, pointing the way to next economy opportunities. And so to the extent that we're able to do that, it's not just about a program. Uh, it's not just about sort of the, the battle cry. It's about economic empowerment and initiatives that can really create wealth uh, create generational wealth uh, in, in, in uh, Black communities. I, I want to just chime in if that's okay. Uh, I mean, this is really not a Black issue. This is an American issue. At the core of it, uh, when we look at the demographic shift that's happening in the next 20, 25 years, the U.S. is going to be a country, a majority people of color. And as we look at uh, people of color, especially Black folks, in terms of the, the, the disparities in economic performance, that really represents a competitive disadvantage for the United States. We're not going to be, continue to be leaders on a global scale unless Black people have the opportunity to uh, participate fully in the economy 
from the perspective of both building wealth as well as from the perspective of access to opportunities in education, um, that, that, that sort of thing. I mean, a, a study according to the Institute of Policy Studies says that, you know, Black uh, and, and Latino household wealth is projected to fall to zero within the next 50 years if it con continues at the current pace that it's, that it's on right now. That is problematic. So you've got an issue of you've got now a very poor demographic that represents the majority of people in the U.S. That's where we're headed, as well as a, a demographic that's not actually able to contribute fully. And so you've got resources, latent talent, latent assets and things in these communities that aren't able to be actually um, scaled. And they're not able to be scaled and developed and cultivated because our public policy hasn't really uh, uh, been, been focused on it, and there hasn't been an honest conversation. The conversation has really been framed as lazy black people that live in the hood that don't want to work and, and don't want to actually build things in, and they don't want to pull themselves up by their boot, bootstraps. But the reality of it is that public policy at every step along the way has been an impediment to black and brown people, and especially black people, getting those opportunities to actually grow businesses, scale businesses, and create wealth in the community. And, uh, and, and, and I think the beauty of the time that we're in right now is that COVID is going to create new opportunities with the, with the nearshoring of, uh, of investments that have gone over to China. So a lot of that's gonna be coming back this way. Um, with the uh, investments in cybersecurity and that sort of thing, there are a lot of new opportunities. So, we're, uh, so the beauty of the challenge is that we've got a bunch of problems. And quite frankly, the old solutions that we have aren't gonna be enough to solve them. And we can actually find a way to leverage latent talent and latent, uh, uh, latent uh, 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 ingenuity in the black community to actually address some of these issues. We can create new wealth and we can actually solve and make the US economy more competitive over time. And, and let me just add one other thing. I mean, the reason why I um, am enamored with uh, like a career in economic development is we get to change the system, right? When I led economic development in Newark, when I started participating even with IEDC. I mean, I, I enjoy being a member of the Economic Development Research Partners, ERDP, because, uh, ER, 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 Economic Development. ERP. ER, ER, EDR, EDR, EDRP. EDRP. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the reason why I love EDRP is we get to influence how the profession thinks about topics like this, right? So the people on this call, we have a seat that can change systemic, you know, all the systemic racism and the systemic issues that we, we can allocate resources, we can advocate, we can analyze the, the challenge, we can, you know, create new programs. Um, and so I just want to, you know, just to make clear that the people on this call uh, and who are, you know, sitting in seats of economic development, whether it's a micro change or a, a real macro change we have power to, to 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 do something here and that that's why i love economic development so i i guess with that lanier i mean how do you make it you know sustaining i mean you look at our industry and diversity lack of diversity in our economic development you know four percent of the professionals in our industry are black four percent are hispanic so you, that's eight percent of 92 88 percent so how do you kind of really have that long-term influence about changing policies at the city level, the state level, the federal level, when you really don't have a very diverse industry. And typically, you talk about economic development, most guys are out chasing, hey, I gotta make my numbers. I gotta get my job numbers and my investment numbers. Well, that's too hard to do that stuff now in a black and brown community. The hand-holding, which, you know, I learned from you. So the handholding of going out there and really cultivating deals and structuring deals, and you basically become a developer. A lot of guys aren't equipped to do that. They aren't equipped to do the handholding, the hard deals, the long-term deals. You know, I talk about deals in Chicago where I was a consultant. You know, the Walmart, there's a Walmart, neighborhood Walmart on the 47th Cottage Grove. It has apartments on the upper level, a Walmart neighborhood store on the bottom. It took us six years to get it done. It's patience, you know, that's a long-term deal. A lot of guys aren't equipped to do that. Now, you, we're equipped to do that because, you know, we learn, we talk, Rod and you and me, and we all kind of share best practices, but the average professional 
as it relates to economic development, is not geared to do that. So how do we change the industry to get people to do, hey, I want you to make the numbers too, you know, job creation, job retention, investment numbers, but hey, over here, you gotta do the heavy lift over here and some hand holding and small business development, workforce development, and really doing some urban development deals, which are long-term deals and take a lot of moving parts to get them done. That's a whole different beast, man. Now, look, this advocacy now around, you know, doing inclusive economic development work, doing inclusive economic growth work, I think opens a, a window and a, a, you know, a lane for traditional economic developers to be able to, you know, be rewarded for you know, programs, efforts, allocation of time and resources uh, to uh, go and do the, you know, more difficult deals. But also, you know, this, you know, the, there's a focus on where's next economy growth and how do we, again, position people of color to lead and drive next economy growth. So it's not 50% of our work is just about helping a you know, new grocery store get developed in the you know, toughest part of town. But the other 50% of the work is, you know, sort of helping people of color own, uh, you know, green economy, you know, co uh, you know uh, companies and get capital to launch technology firms. That's where I hope we're going. And I think, again, this discussion and the, the pandemic, the, the protest and the political pandemonium is all creating, you know, just a window for us to, just as we're doing now, to talk about these issues and to figure out how we create programs, but also allocate capital, right? The other thing that often I hear all the time is, every time people try to help people of color, they create a new program, a new capacity building program. It's like, look, can you just create a way to create some contract opportunities to get some capital to help us do some deals, right? As opposed to uh, a new program. So this focused on all of us, let me mention one other thing really quick and I'll be quiet. All of us uh, in heading economic development organizations, uh, we have, the organization has a law firm or some legal representation. It has an accounting firm that does the annual audit. It has someone that manages either its investment or 401k for its employees. I challenge all of us to go back today and say, are any of those service providers African-American owned firms? And if not, or at least the African-American partner in a traditional firm. If not, that is a very specific, you know, not just, you know, do we order our lunch and coffee from the caterer down the street or, you know, buy our supplies. There's some, you know, there's an IT firm, right? So any of the professional service providers immediately will make a change. Those firms, all the research shows African-American owned firms hire more African-American employees. So if, you, if you're engaging an African-American law firm or African-American investment management firm or an African-American accounting firm, IT firm, right? Professional services, there's opportunities there. So I'll, I'll uh, You know, so one of the things that's excited about, about, about uh, I mean, I think Lanier framed it perfectly, is this question of this window. We've got a window that I don't think we've had historically. And part of that window is that there is a level of economic developers in general, none of us really work for ourselves. We really all report to boards, we report to political systems and political, and, and the challenge of politics and government is that they're on these four year cycles and the systemic change that we're talking about is much longer term. And I think that this, this the, 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 the tide right now has created a window to actually be able to have those conversations about longer term opportunities and, and, and to underscore the beauty and the, and, the, and the breadth and depth of the opportunity that we have right now. When you look at what governments control, you're talking about procurement processes. Um, you're talking about, yeah, programs, but what about, but what about capital investment? What about um, uh, the bully pulpit? Um, we have, as economic developer, those tools at our disposal today. We've got access not only to the governmental tools, but we've got access to a network of business leaders who come to us for this, for that, and for the other. They all come to us because we've, we've got the magic incentives plan or whatever it is that we have. How do we actually leverage that influence in a much more strategic way to actually drive investment and opportunities to, to Black businesses? Well, I mean... 
one of the things that we're trying to do here in Dallas is as we work on an incentive deal or structure a transaction, we make sure that, you know, we tie employment to some of our hardest, you know, lowest unemployment census tracts or make sure they're hiring from those areas. We look at ways in which we take some of the incentive and provide the incentive for local businesses within those same, um, you know, high poverty, high unemployment census tracts to make sure there's a, a tie back to those areas of the city. I think you're seeing more of that around the country. I think that's really about, you know, making sure that the investment for the large corporation goes back to the community where they're hiring, but they're also incentivizing and providing capital uh, for these businesses in these areas of the, of the city. Um, I think more or less if we look at our policies and change those, not just for the city of Dallas, I think other cities are kind of buying into that. We talk about inclusive and equitable economic development. That's kind of the cornerstone of the workforce and supporting small businesses, procurement, but we also make sure we got to educate businesses in the black community. It's not about just doing construction work and putting up drywall. There's the professional services, there's property management, there's the accounting firms, there's the marketing capacity. There's a whole slew of businesses that, you know, city engages other companies around, you know, the United States or the city, which we buy stuff from. So we need to be more, you know, diverse as far as, um, make sure businesses understand there's more opportunities out there. I want to make sure we don't for lose one of the comments that Courtney brought up, which is this issue of diversity within our own profession of economic development. He asked, and so I, I guess that this question is going to go to all the rest of us, but how do we make that change that the representation of people of color who are economic developers certainly does not mirror that of the communities and the nation that we serve. I'm throwing that out there to you guys to. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. I mean, one of the realities is that most people, and, and especially young, young, young black professionals, in many cases don't know about economic development as a profession. Uh, and I think, and, and that's probably true across the board. And how do you learn about professions? It's about the people that are around you that are in that profession. So when you're talking about 4% of the profession being black, uh, uh, most, most people, and, and then that's problem one. Problem two, which might actually be the bigger problem, is that everything is characterized as economic development. It doesn't matter who you talk to, they're gonna tell you they do economic development. You're like, what do you, it has nothing to do with economic development as a practice. I think part of what's core to this is being aggressive, you know, and, and, and I'm gonna be un unabashed about this plug because all of us have served on the board of IEDC at some point, is, you know, really leveraging the IEDC network, the International Economic Development Council, and making sure that we, you know, that we, uh, we make it, uh, make young people in our networks aware that there is a resource if they want to learn about the profession. The other thing that I do a lot of is I do a lot of speaking at universities and every time I speak about it, uh, speak at a university, I don't just tell people what it, they're always like, oh, what you do, it's so cool. I'm like, well, you can do it too. And I think the, the reality of, of kind of highlighting what we do and, sh and making sure that people understand that the beauty of this is for somebody who's intellectually curious and a little ADD like me is that it encompasses a whole lot of different things. So a day on the job, no two days are really the same. And the, and the different tools that one has to pull from to be a successful economic developer are quite vast. Uh, and, th and then the last one, I th the last point that I think I'll make about this is that part of the, re the reality is that nobody understands communities of color or black communities like black people. So if we're expecting a profession that's overwhelmingly white to lead in, in, in restoring black communities, it will never happen. And, and that's not because people are bad people, it's because they don't understand these communities. And so we've got to be ag aggressive about making sure that we make sure that these communities understand the profession of economic development and that we go in and that we show demonstrable results in terms of there is an opportunity to have successful investments in those communities. And, and, and when those investments and when those, those uh, and job creation, when that stuff happens, we have to blast it very loudly because a lot of the, the traditional, you know, um, uh, smokestack chasers of the industry wouldn't necessarily say that that's something that's worth spending their time in because it's too far out. But when we can show success, it's going to push others to, to, to try and get that same sort of success. So I, I think you raise a good point, which is that just rationally, this is, it makes good economic sense 
because as you have people who understand how to solve the problems, who are from those communities who look like them, that's an advantage in being able to do more effective economic development. Uh, I think you also brought up another really important point was the issue that you told that student, you can too. Because all of us, all of us on this panel, we all have our stories of how it is that we came here. And I didn't think that I could do what I'm doing now as a getting my, my master's degree in city planning and going on to be an economic developer. And part of that is because I didn't see anybody who looked like me doing those things. But there was one guy and he's like, you can do this. I can do this. You can do this. Don't feel like, you know, you'll never be ready. And in fact, it, it's just that issue of other people bringing folks in. So just as Lanier talked about African-American-owned businesses hire other African-Americans, this is another dimension to our profession and the lack of diversity. Anybody else on, want to touch on that before we move on to something else? Actually, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I, I'd actually like to, to um, give another example of how we can get more people of our people to work in economic development. I bet every one of you have been invited to do a career day at, um, uh, in one of your schools, elementary schools. And I had the opportunity to do that. I'm an accountant and I usually talk about accounting because it's my favorite subject. I love accounting. And then I'm not sure why I did it at this particular, in this particular session, but instead of talking about accounting at the last minute, I decided to talk about economic development. I had fifth graders asking questions that were, I was so amazed. I really didn't think that they would have gotten it. I want you to know that, you know, police and fire, um, they always have the most kids hanging around them. I had more kids at my table asking questions about how things happen in the communities they live in. And until now, I didn't really understand why they were so interested, but I can definitely see it now. Just saying this, why would they ask, how, how did they get to be so interested? And that's because even in fifth grade, they're thinking that maybe they can make a difference in their own communities. So that's one thing I'd like to say, if you have an opportunity to talk about economic development, because that's when kids start thinking about, well, what do I wanna be? So instead of saying, I want to be a doctor or a policeman or a, I don't want to say policeman anymore, a doctor or a firefighter, um, they may say, I want to be an economic developer. And <clears throat> I'm looking at my three friends who are a part of our <clears throat> EDOs on a mission team that I have not heard from in six months or more. And I want to encourage you because this was our big opening to say, here we are wanting to put our talents together. We've been talking about this for 10 years or more. And I know it's been busy. COVID-19 has thrown such a monkey wrench in everything that we're doing. But I've sent something out even in the midst of COVID-19. Hi, guys. So please, this is, we've got a, put our money where our, our what, what is it saying? Put your money where your mouth is. Put your Marva, money where your mouth is. And we- Marva, you got me, I'm here. As far as forming a group, we know who we are, and it's time for us to say, okay. So very important, we have to encourage, when we see them, one of the things we said we we're gonna do was mentor young people of color, and we see them in, at IEDC meetings. When we see them, don't let anybody feel like I did for years, the IEDC, just left by myself to try to figure out how do I transverse this group of strangers that I don't know, and I'm not one of the, those outgoing kind of people. But I have to say, since the diversity, I served on the diversity committee, and I wasn't doing that then, but since I served on the diversity committee, there's a, I started looking for people that I didn't know and I didn't see. And I got an email from a young man who is the economic development director in Stone Mountain, a graduate of Morehouse College that I met 
and we talked several times and he sent me an email to say, hey, Marva, where are you? What are you doing? This is where I am. And he's in walking distance from where I am. So we have to connect when, we, when it's free for COVID-19. But I totally agree with what Rod said. I didn't hear much of what Courtney said. The, the um, reception was pretty bad. But we really have to be very conscious about mentoring, um, whether it's young or old. If it's somebody that we don't know, that we, they look like they, they're really not comfortable in the space, we have to be friendly to them and encourage them and um, you know, help them figure it out. It took us a while, to, it took me a while to figure it out. I mean, one of the things we're doing too in our, neighbor, in our, in our community here, we're actually doing an outreach program to, to educate young people about economic development because Excellent. Of course, I'm on the island of, of Puerto Rico and we've generally got a lack of economic development capacity. So our organization is actually doing outreach to make sure that young people know about the profession and perhaps other economic development organizations can do the same. As you guys notice, I, I like data and I like to talk about numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the numbers related to this is, is that in the, the state of the profession that was done, the, the research done by IEDC, staff diversity is not a priority for the majority of economic developers who responded to that survey. And it was even less of a priority in 2019, which is the last year that it was done, than in the 2018 survey. So, so economic development staff diversity is decreasing as a priority. Hmm. If anyone would like to, I want to talk about other stuff, but if anybody wants some, some final thoughts on this. So, I'd... so only thing I'd like to add to that, and I love, you know, I wish I could just do all of the, the research projects that, that, you know, the questions pop in my head. I love to um, really understand that economic development organizations that are led by people of color have more people of color on their staff, right? That is my... Uh, that's the theory, you know, that's the thesis that I love to, to test. And so this thought of, you know, getting more Courtney's and Rod's who are leading organizations. I saw Clarence Holtz on the uh, call. You know, there's, you know, outstanding economic developers, you know, leading world-class organizations around the country. And I, I'm sure that if you looked at their teams, uh, there's more diversity on those teams. So our effort to continue to identify people who might lead these organizations uh, over time, we'll continue to see an increase in uh, diversity among the staffs. I think that's, that's the evolution of our, of our industry. Okay. Let, let me now ask about this, the, another issue, which is in the communities that you've served, and, and I know in many of your cases, you've served multiple communities. How have you experienced support or resistance to targeting programs and services to economically disadvantaged groups such as African Americans? Well, can I just answer? I'd like to speak to Lanier's um, comments because in our organization, we're very intentional and we want people that are diverse in, on our team. We want people of color. We want women and men. We want young and old and it. Last year, we added two young people. One was African American. They were, they're both amazing. We're hoping that they can take our jobs when we retire. Um, it's changed our whole culture at, in our team because we had a, a lot of older people on our staff. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I love it because they're bringing new, fresh ideas and new life to the organization. So. I think you, you need to be intentional because as Rod, I think, said, nobody goes into this industry. So you have to be intentional and try to seek people out and guide them through economic development. Hire them because they have a great attitude and they're talented and they're willing to learn and then send them through training to become an economic developer. Because really, I used to coach and you can never change an attitude. You can help somebody kind of do better and learn more, but if they have a bad attitude, you know, you can't train them, even no matter how much talent they have. So we've been blessed in that way. But let me just tell you a little bit about our community. The city of Saginaw has a population of 50, a little less than 50,000. It's comprised of 43% African Americans, 37% um, white, 15% Hispanic. Our poverty rate is 34%. Our median household income is less than $30,000. 
And I, I tell you this, not to, just to tell you that we're not a wealthy community, but I think we've done a lot of things over the years to change that, um, the racial economic inequality and how it's impacted our communities. And, you know, I won't take too long, but it went back to 1967 when there were revolts and riots happening in Detroit. And we had our first black mayor, Henry Marsh, who was just three months into the job. Um, one of the responses that he had was to, he and the bishop of our Catholic church decided to form a group of people from all walks of life as they wanted the people that they would bring together in times of crisis. And we still meet today. In fact, the last two weeks, we've had Zoom calls where we've had all those members plus our sheriff, our three chiefs of police in the city and surrounding the city, and our leaders in the African American community leading discussion around George Floyd's death and the ensuing protest and unrest. So, you know, through the years, we've formed the Bridge Center for Racial Harmony. We've started leadership programs that still go on today. So I, I think my, my message here is you have to be intentional, you have to care, and you have to want to make a difference. And that's what we've been trying to do in Saginaw. That's great. Joanne, one, one of the reasons, and, and I'd actually still like the other the panelists to just respond to that question, those who, who'd like to, but many people may not know the work that you've done, Joanne. Um, can you talk really briefly about you made it a priority for your year as chair of IEDC to focus on the issue of inequality? Can you talk a little bit more about that, why that was important and what you've seen? Yeah, so, well, I wasn't the first woman to serve as chair of IEDC, but I was one of few, and, and I, honestly, I never had the aspiration of becoming chair. I was actually approached by leadership who wanted to improve diversity of the organization, so that was a good sign, and that's the only reason I agreed, because I, Anatalio and I went, came on the board together, and I'd just as soon sit at one of those side tables and give my opinion rather than lead. But each year, the chairman selects a theme or a platform, and it's a 5,000 plus member organization. So you, you want to make sure whatever you're doing is meaningful and you, can, and you can actually move the needle and make a difference. So some of the prior chairs had selected, you know, topics of the time like immigration, engaging young professionals, entrepreneurship, and becoming more internationally focused. But at the time, um, we were finally coming out of the 2009 economic meltdown and communities like mine in Saginaw, all, what I saw was growing disparity between the haves and have nots. Um, people were being left behind because they had barriers that, uh, that they were facing to employment. Yet at the same time, we'd go on our retention visits and hear that companies couldn't find talent. And we thought there's a huge disconnect. So. As Lanier talked about, the Economic Development Research Partners, mm -hmm. everything that we did surrounded that theme. And we did a paper called Opportunities for All Strategies for Inclusive Economic Development. We had training, we created a diversity committee. And, you know, I'm proud to say that two years ago, our dear friend Craig Richard chaired, um, who's the leader of Tampa Bay Economic Development. And last year, Tracy McDaniel, who used to be with Choose New Jersey now as a president of TIP Strategies. She was the first African-American woman to serve as chair. So there's, it's created some, at least awareness. I'm sad to see that survey result that you're talking about on Talio, but I really believe that, that we're gonna see that tip back the other way. And we have an opportunity this year, Lanier, when we go to EDRP Zoom wise in Grand Rapids, uh, I know I'm gonna be on a panel to talk about this. So hopefully we can come out with some really great research. Anybody else want to jump on that, the respond to that question about kind of what you're experiencing in terms of support or resistance for pro economic development programs focused on African Americans, people of color, or other kind of disenfranchised well, Let me just ask something very quick. So I believe, and I get a call at least once a week over the last month or so, what can we do? Wells Fargo, Wealth Advisors, City, um, you know, the foundation community. And, and I believe um, both as an entrepreneur and an economic developer, I think about it this way. We got to create vehicles and, 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 and vessels that can be um, 
places that can can move this work along, right? So, you know, all of the stats and and reciting them and um, you know the protest and the you know the uh, all of the the evidence is there. So people are saying, so what should we do? So our job as economic developers is we sh- could do this if we had ten thousand dollars or a million dollars or ten million dollars. We should do this to address the issue. And so all of our work, and I think what we should be doing is figuring out, you know, creatively repositioning programs, creating new programs, finding new investment vehicles, finding new professionals we can engage, as I said, lawyers, accountants, investment managers, stuff that people say, what can we do? Do this, invest here. Let's, you know, let's put capital here. We think we can get a return here. Here's a great place for philanthropy. Here's a place for private investment. Otherwise, if we just keep articulating the problem without saying, here's what we want to do, you know, we don't get uh, any, any solution. So create vehicles investment. La- last little thing I'll say about it is it, it came out, I think about this a lot when the Opportunity Zone uh, you know, legislation came out. Everyone was so excited about opportunities on opportunities on opportunities on. And as the rules of opportunities on continued to you know become clear, what became very evident to me was we have to create investable opportunities. Mm-hmm. So if we wanted deals in you know lower income uh, communities and we wanted to do deals with entrepreneurs of color, our job as economic developers were the structured deals that were investable. So it wasn't just like, hey, this community is opportunity zone, these entrepreneurs we want to support. It was, how do you put the pro forma together? How do you figure out what the investment return can be? How do you decide what level of public assistance is necessary to make a deal investable? So again, it's, it's the vehicle that we all have the ability to structure um, so that How did you get in that support can happen. How did you get in that picture? So, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I think that, you know, obviously some of the, the themes that you're bringing up are really important. I think the issue of, of equity, entrepreneurship, we need to own, right? We brown people need to own things. Um, and, and just how important that is. I uh, want to, I'm not gonna close this right yet. This is clearly an important conversation. They cannot get addressed in a few minutes. It's a conversation that needs to continue in our profession and with the people that we bring into the profession. Are there some, Closing ideas, some closing. Let, let's let's go with what Lanier is talking about. We don't need another blue ribbon committee to study this, right? We know what the problem is. The information is there. It's about action. What are some things that we can do in economic development to engage this? And it's okay if you repeat yourself. Just this time, be succinct. <laughs> so, so let me just say something. Yes. Um, the, my quest, one question is, have we been in the past bold enough to ask the right questions or to make the right statements about inequity in our own communities when we're constantly getting pushed back when we try to create those equitable opportunities? In my community in Atlanta, um, it has been so difficult. There's a lot of lip service that... Um, goes on about wanting to do the right thing, but it really doesn't happen because there's nothing behind it. Um, We are the most active and most successful development authority in the state of Georgia, if not in the Southeast, Um, because it's Atlanta. And we even beat out Invest Atlanta in terms of the projects that come to us for assistance. And yet we have not been able so each time I bring up the point of um, the projects are located in a very distressed census tract, we don't have tools in our toolbox, and the handful of tools that we have in our toolbox, we're not willing to advertise 
that they are for investment in distressed areas. And economic development, for me, is to do that, is to undergird the communities that need the investment more than the communities that are already on their way. But it has been a very challenging conversation. And I was pretty much told, um, if you don't like the way we're doing things, um, but I felt that I was put here for a reason and I was determined that I was gonna do the job that I thought I was brought in to do 20 something years ago. And so I continue pushing things like new market tax credits. I continue pushing. During this, I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed, well, I am a little bit embarrassed, but not really so. During this past, um, the protest and everything, I thought about it, nothing was ever said in our staff meetings, nothing was said. No question, how do you feel about this? There are three, four black women that work on our team, three whites. Four black women all have boys. Nothing was said. I eventually raised it. And I have to say, I am pleased to say that the response was much better than I expected. Um, I was able to sent to them the response that IEDC put out and the ones that were recommended by Tracy and um, the other gentleman. Um, and it was well taken and we're getting ready to, to put a response on our website and, and, and do some other things. The conversation is so much easier to have now and I'm seeing where um, if I just continue promoting the types of things that we need in our community, that we do need more tools in our toolbox um, that is specifically for um, the black community. People are beginning, because of this protest, people are beginning to really understand um, what has never been said. It's uncomfortable to say it um, in public. This protest has really, brought some things to the open. And um, so I'm glad for that. I think that we're going to see in, in my organization anyway, we're going to see more effort being made to provide more or to go after some of those tools that are already existing that we can put in our toolbox to, um, to do more, to bring more incentives and to help um, businesses that, I mean, equity, there, how, we, how do you bring 20 to 30% equity to a project in, in our community? Most people just don't have it, but it can, be, it can be made. So be brave, be bold, and go to our banks. My, my next recommendation is that we call in the four or five banks that we do business with and say, hey, we need some funds to put in to create an economic development fund for this particular area to provide um, coming out of COVID, our businesses need a lot of help and they don't need loans. They don't need loans to put them in further debt. So that's, that's some of the things that we're gonna, we're gonna be asking for. We need that support, commit to it and um, we'll manage it, so. Thank you, Marva. Mm -hmm. I just wanna suggest some solutions and programs that, that we can be working on in economic development. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really exciting. I think one of the things that I would say is that communities have to act now while investing in the long term. In many cases, the conversation around economic inclusion and, and black businesses really is the byproduct of some political tension that emerges. So there's this lipstick on a pig approach that says we're going to do program X, we're going to have conversation Y, but there's not really any sustained investment. And so at the end of the day, uh, money is your, your your budget shows your values. And, and where you invest shows your value. So uh, uh, programs that are actually targeted uh, to, 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 um, to actually get the kind of clear outcomes and to I identify and define those outcomes. I've seen where businesses of color or black businesses are, 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 are all stroke with the, with the broad brush. And it's this generic program that works for micro enterprises and really doesn't actually help businesses scale. And I think at the end of the day, um, people are tired of seeing programs that don't help businesses scale, but just kind of allow businesses to, to merely exist. And I think 
um, at the core of that is having specific uh, uh, and targeted strategies versus generic and global ones. Um, I think, and, and by that I mean these programs that are developed need to be geography specific in many cases. So what are the neighborhoods that actually need investment and how do you drive uh, specific types of investment into those neighborhoods. They need to be sector specific. Um, black businesses don't only need to be in uh, traditional, uh, uh, in traditional, uh, I would say, uh, uh, lifestyle businesses. Uh, there needs to be more in professional services, and there actually needs to be more in innovation sectors. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be initiatives to actually push businesses and give businesses a hands hands up in those in those sectors. There needs to be an, a focus on on pushing larger businesses, your anchor institutions, to actually have policies that, that, um, that provide access and greater inclusion for businesses owned by people of color. Those are some of the things that are really at the core of it. And then, and then the final thought I would say is, you know, it's not just about a penny in the hand today. It's really about long-term wealth building. Long-term wealth building, the community has to be more competitive. So our approach to actually investing and trying to scale and help businesses uh, and, and black uh, uh, communities uh, uh, matter in economic development has to be about actually making those communities fundamentally more competitive through our investments in them in infrastructure and in education and healthcare across the board. We can't kind of do patchwork solutions and expect to get uh, long-term answers. And, and I would be remiss if I would say, you know, some of the thoughts I just shared uh, and, and please excuse the plug are going to be in a, a, a document that I have coming out in about a month. Uh, through living cities on a guide to helping cities uh, grow businesses owned by uh, people of color. Wonderful. And we'll, we'll all commit to helping share that information when it comes out. Yes. See how I yes. follow all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Any others who'd like to share some ideas about solutions and things that we can be doing? I think Rod and Marva kind of hit on everything. So, I think one key component is really talk about real estate development. You know, real estate is still a very, you know, um, not very diverse field. You know, only 2% of the people within commercial real estate are African American or minority. So that's a field that needs to change. And you look at redeveloping of communities, real estate development is kind of the core of that. So having programs to educate people about the development process, and real estate ownership and commercial real estate and leasing, I mean, all those things kind of, kind of being integrated into this overall technical assistance that these communities need or the African-American community needs. We also look at this overall technical assistance with entrepreneurship, training, and providing technical services, not just for the short term, but for the long term. Mm -hmm. How to become an entrepreneur, how to scale your business, how to approach a bank, and how to you know, pull down the levers of capital that from equity to public-private partnerships, to working with the city, to sourcing federal dollars. I mean, it, that's a skill that a lot of people don't have, but I think you kind of need to have that, you know, some type of training program set up. I think you also need to have partnerships with the historically black colleges and universities. Um, I know IADC has been talking about that for the past 10 years, and uh, we really haven't done it. But I think being in D.C. and being a Howard grad, you know, I'm going to try to lead that and being on the board, uh, try to leverage that. I'm going to look at, you know, my partners are here on the um, this call right now with Marva and Lanier and Rod and, and you two to make sure that we're all kind of pushing to make sure there's a some type of programs with the historical black college and universities to talk about economic development and real estate development, because that's really the core of changing communities. The I'll just add, oh, go ahead, Joanne. Oh, the, sorry, Lanier. The only thing I would want to add is that in communities like Saginaw, where we're entitlement, we're getting money directly from HUD, but a lot of it is used for nonprofits or for police protection. And we need to see if HUD would make some changes in some of their rules so that entitlement communities can actually get additional funds under COVID but with more flexible guidelines to use it towards some of the programs that you guys are talking about. Because these are really great programs, but we just don't have the funds to support them. So how do we do that? Besides going to some of our financial institutions and some of our larger businesses, it seems like the federal government needs to kind of loosen their, their rules a little bit for us to get some of these things done. So Lanier? Yeah, all I would add is, you know, there's old statement that says, you know, do what you can with what you have, 
you know, where you, where you are right now, right? Just do business, right? If there is a opportunity at the leadership level of your organization to hire an African-American law firm, an African-American accounting firm, an African-American firm that might manage the 401k for the organization, an African-American IT firm, right? Those are immediate things we can do right now without, we can influence as leaders, we can persuade and advocate at our board level to the extent that those changes are needed. We can do that right now. It's not a new program. And those are actionable steps. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I would add, which I really like is, um, you know, we just launched in New Jersey something called the Black and Latino Angel Investment Fund of New Jersey. It really is focusing on helping people of color get the first fifty or hundred thousand dollar of capital to launch technology and other growth companies. Uh, and it's and it's really using the pulpit of our economic development leadership to find private investors that would commit fifty thousand dollars of what we hope will not be. Uh, uh, philanthropy, but that will organize the program so that people are able to get a return on their investment. But it's that first hundred thousand, fifty to hundred thousand dollars of capital that's really needed. To tell people, and and we can do that again from our pulpit, right? That, there should be a could easily be a black and Latino angel investment fund of of Saginaw or Dallas or Atlanta, and you know, and if they're not, it may be you know we can use our our, our pulpit to help expand, you know, the capital so that, you know, more investment could be made in, in, in growth companies owned by people of color. And I, I'd like to say we, we all also need to be encouraging or expecting the businesses that we support to be responsible and to recognize, I always tell the businesses that I lend to that this is not government money. This is my dollars my taxpayers' dollars that has come in, come back to the community. And when I lend it to you, I expect you to repay it so that we can revolve it into another loan for somebody else. So we have to, uh, there's a tendency to think that it's government money and it doesn't have to be paid back. And um, so re-educating our community on their responsibility to also help to take care of themselves. That maybe reparation is coming, but I don't know when. But if we're going to work with you, we need your cooperation. Um, businesses, all my businesses, my developers, I, I ask my, what's your tangible give back? What's the tangible, when we provide an incentive, what's the tangible give back to the community? Infrastructure, um, training programs, internships, that's an expectation. That's a conversation that I have pushed with my white leadership, and it was a hard conversation to start, but do you know what? They are doing that. So when um, we are looking at creating new CDFIs in our communities, like our SBA 504 lenders, um, to add CDFI lending to their program, to just so we have more leverage and we have more. And um, that's intended to go directly into those communities. But I wanna be sure that the return is there, as Lanier just said. It's not just, it's, this is not a gift. It's an investment in our communities and everybody's responsible. So I'm holding my folks responsible. In terms of this issue of being responsible and having accountability, I'll share one idea that came from uh, Mark Lottman who talked about this issue of as, as you create a, a board, right? Because many economic development organizations report to boards is who is on that board? Mm -hmm. The people who can afford to be on that board and who are in positions of power tend to be all the same types of folks. It is the banker. It is the lawyer. It is, right? Um, Lanier making the point, okay, well, some of these can be, can be brown and, and black. He also brought up a point. It's like, what if you had somebody who had been unemployed for two years on your board, right? I think that the conversation will keep coming back to this issue of those who are really in a difficult situation. When you have brown people on your board, uh, when you have women, when you have veterans, when you have the formerly incarcerated, that's a different model, right? The, another thing that I think is, is important to this, and I heard it as a, as a theme across everybody on this 
is the issue of entrepreneurship. Small business that can have the opportunity to grow into larger businesses. That's an important part of where economic development needs to focus. Will the coronavirus pandemic, will what's going on with Black Lives Matter and the protests shift that as a focus? I hope so. I hope that we recognize that importance. And then lastly, here's a structural thing, which goes, perhaps can get to this address, address the issue of what that survey showed us, that staff diversity was not a priority for the majority of economic developers, at least in IEDC, who weren't focused on that. Is I'll go back to my own experience a long time ago when I was a university student. Uh, there, one of the requirements is, is that through the entire undergraduate career, you just have to take at least one class on ethnic studies. And if you took that one class, it changed a lot of people's lives. It changed their view, especially people who have come from communities or went to a high school where they were white and so was everybody else. So was the community. So were their friends. So were their experiences. That one class changed the way people saw this issue. Can we do this? Why couldn't we do this within our profession? We have an ethics course that economic developers need to take. You know, think about this, like how, not that I'm saying credit analysis isn't important, but it's a required course in economic development to become certified. Shouldn't it also be a requirement that we focus on these issues of economic inequality and how race and gender and, and former incarceration and homelessness and all the types of insecurities that are there, that's something that we can do so that we can be smarter about the work that we do. Uh, we're going to add Rod Miller's writing to the uh, economic development certification exam. <laughs> Require reading. I second that. <laughs> so I, I want to also speak to some of the folks who are not able to, to talk during the webinar, which is the, the people who are attending. And there are a lot of great questions that came in, and, I, and we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but let me explain to you why. It's not because your questions weren't good, it's because your questions were too good. The level of complexity, uh, your questions and the information that you're asking for is right on. And please keep all of us accountable, but also economic developers in general for answering the types of questions that you have. Uh, some of the questions you ask, requires such a level of sophistication in the response that it would overwhelm. So you, you did too good a job in the questions. Let me you, add that, like like Mario had a phenomenal question. It wasn't his. It was, it, he, so he was the person who was moderating it. It came oh, from another oh, really? Okay, got it. I was going to say, I was let referring me, that to Courtney. He's the dean. All the hard questions. <laughs> let me see. Who else should we go? <laughs> uh, you know. You want some great questions. <laughs> Lanier, you want to? Uh, so, so again, I was going to be firm to, to Courtney and to Ra. I mean, they're the dean of the hard questions. But uh, <laughs> I, I know, believe, I mean, last I checked, you work at a university, so. As you said, they, the questions are so complex, uh, Anatolia. I mean, really, you know, this, you know, how do you, address, you know, sort of 400 years of systemic, you know, sort of racism there. And then how, to, it's like, A was the first part of that question. Then the second part of it is, how do you then align education, economics, entertainment? Man, I would be, uh, I mean, that's a tough question. And again, I think all of this work, the way I answer tough questions like that is, all of our work is evolutionary, not revolutionary. It is, you know, it's, is running a marathon, right? That yeah. we'll continue to try to address systemic racism sort of one day at a time by creating opportunities, creating investment funds, hiring diverse professionals, advancing more people of color on our boards and in our leadership. Similarly, similarly, we, you know, with our, uh, you know, our efforts to, to address sort of alignment of different industries it's the same way. That is all, you know, can I get people to invest in an equity fund at the same time together? Can I get people uh, to focus on a neighborhood and education and entrepreneurship and economic development and political power? That work is chipping away at it. There's no miracle 
solution, unfortunately. At least it's been my experience. The one thing I just added that very quickly is the answer to those questions is where the money is. And so as we think about opportunities to innovate and create opportunities in our community, the more that we can actually ask the right questions and push businesses to come up with solutions. And I would argue that a lot of times the best solutions are gonna be from within the communities. That's really where new economic opportunity lies. Yep. And this is gonna require innovation. This is gonna require innovation in yep. the work that economic developers do. Because so many of the solutions that you all have suggested are not part of the canon of education and what it, what it is we're supposed to do. Tradition in many ways hurts us mm -hmm. to solve the problems that actually have been around for a long time. You know, one of the things I became aware of is the fact that we're not having the conversations with the majority. We're not having the conversations with the people who keep these systemic um, injustices in place. And it is time for us to start having those com conversations in our communities. So um, civic dinners, are you guys doing civic dinners in your community? Courtney, he's gone. Um, us. Civic us. dinners is gonna be a great opportunity to, um, to have those open dialogue. Um, you know, people are saying to me, I didn't know that this was so bad. Yes, because they're used to working with people like us who they're not afraid of. They don't fear us and they, but we also have a responsibility not to get comfortable in their comfort with us. Um, we have to keep the dialogue. We're not going to burn anything down, but it almost, almost like that. We've got to keep the fire going. Our passion for the work that we do and why we do this, we have to keep that conversation going. We cannot, Martin Luther King's, um, the work that he did, I felt has dwindled away. We've gotten comfortable and here today, is telling us, no, that work was just starting. And we allowed such a long time to pass before we elevated that conversation. So I think a part of bringing money into the community, et cetera, we have to remind the majority of the role they play in being silent and to ensure that everyone is educated on the history of this country, why we are where we are today, still having this conversation. And we shouldn't be having this conversation 25 years from now. And, and I may need to jump out. I just want to leave with do business with somebody black. Do business with somebody black. Please. We can all do that today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think with that, I'm going to bring this to a close. But let's all continue the conversations in our communities. Let's continue working together with people who support this issue and with people who don't. So thank you all for joining and we'll make this all in all this information available. Thank, thank, you. thank you for forgiving me for dropping off at the last minute. I'm thank so sorry. Great presentation too, Anatala. That really Excellent. was very powerful. Excellent. I'm glad I was able to come on. Nice to thank see you. Thank you. Thank you all. I just